Now, freezing embryos gives you more possibilities and problems. Falling out over frozen embryos. Freezing embryos, as opposed to eggs on their own, means two parties are involved. Unlike a natural pregnancy, where a man has no say in termination or treatment, every IVF treatment in the UK requires written consent from both partners at each stage. The removal of the eggs and sperm, the storing, the thawing, the perishing, and the use of them in trying to achieve a pregnancy. Because you can freeze them for long periods, it means there may be a significant change in the partner's intentions between the first trip to the clinic and the time when one or other decides that he or she is ready to become a parent. The recent sad case of Natalie Evans received much attention. At a young age, Natalie Evans was diagnosed with cancer, and the treatment involved removal of her ovaries. She was living with her partner, Howard Johnston, then, and with his assurance that they would remain together, she had eggs removed before the treatment and fertilized with his sperm. So that they wouldn't be affected by the treatment, they were frozen. The embryos in October 2001. After she'd been treated for cancer, but before she got around to using the embryos in May 2002, the relationship between Natalie and Howard broke down. Howard established a home with another woman, and said that he did not want to be a parent with Natalie or be involved in what would be single parenthood for her. Since he himself had come from a broken home, he relied on his rights, which were perfectly clear under the Human Fertilisation Embryology Act 1990, to withdraw his written consent to storage and use of the frozen embryos. Part of the dilemma lay in the speed with which events took place, because there was urgency to start the cancer treatment. The decision to undergo IVF. By Natalie and Howard, was taken very rapidly. Indeed, with it seems no time to reflect or voice doubts with appropriate counselling for the couple individually or together. Nor was it considered that it would be possible for Howard to allow Natalie to use his sperm to become a mother, but that he would not be the legal parent, which is the, a possibility, and have no maintenance responsibility. They never thought about that. The law doesn't appear to provide for this. Arguably, a solution like that, relieving him of responsibility, while acceptable to the adults, would not be a good one for the welfare of any child to be born under those circumstances. Even though the majority of babies in this country are now born out of wedlock, many are born to people living together, and there the men are participating at least temporarily in childcare. On the other hand, it was the case that Howard and Natalie had started to seek fertility treatment before Natalie's diagnosis with cancer, and that they had had sufficient time to become aware of all the implications. Natalie Evans would have kept her autonomy if she had had her eggs frozen alone, without insemination by Howard. But at the date of her treatment in 2001, frozen egg technology was in its infancy, and had not yet produced a baby in this country. Alternatively, she might have opted for anonymous donor sperm, but that would have seemed like an act of rejection or distrust towards Howard, who was supporting her at that stage. The High Court. And the Court of Appeal rejected Natalie's court case, where she asked that Howard be made to keep his word and allow her to use the embryos. The courts ruled that a man has as much right as a woman to say no. The right to give and withdraw his consent, just like a woman, an argument that is hard to disagree with. Had the genders been reversed? There would have been little sympathy with the argument that Natalie should be forced to bear a child for Howard. Imagine they'd frozen embryos because Howard was having treatment for cancer, 
And then after that, he wanted to become a parent. No one would have forced her to carry his embryos to term. Natalie pursued her case to the European Court of Human Rights in 2006, and in 2007 to the ultimate court in Europe, the Grand Chamber. Relying on the human rights of life, private and family life, and no discrimination, but she lost all those appeals as well, on similar grounds of equality. It was her last chance to have her own children, but it wasn't his, although she could have had them by donor eggs. Public opinion was fairly evenly divided between those who agreed that a man should not have parenthood forced upon him in a situation where the process is formal and gradual, as under the Human Embryology Act, and that he should not be made to be a single parent or pay maintenance. On the other hand, there were those who were more sympathetic to Natalie, whose hardship they felt was greater than that which might be suffered by Mr. Johnston Howard. Is there an inconsistency in that a pregnant woman has complete control over decisions about abortion and childbirth without regard to the father? The way to reconcile this is to argue that while the embryo is outside the body, there is complete equality between men and women and their control over it. But once the pregnancy is established inside the woman's body, physiology means that the woman's word alone determines the fate of her body. The new law in the 2000 Act, however, has come up with a partial solution to this. In Schedule 3, Para 7, it is provided that if one of the two partners in this situation withdraws consent to the use of a frozen embryo, the clinic must notify the other partner. And instead of destroying the embryo immediately, it may be stored for 12 months for a cooling off or discussion period. That seems to be a rather good idea. Keep it for a year and see if they can come to an agreement. 